one of America's most famous novelists, J.D. Salinger, author of Catcher in the Rye, is also known for being one of the most elusive. He really didn't want any fanfare around his work. He was a, a very humble person who kind of just wanted to disappear behind his work. This year, his son, Matt Salinger, and his literary estate reached out to the iconic New York Public Library to share his life with the public for the very first time. It was very clear from what J.D. Salinger told his family, and certainly there's one letter in this exhibition where Salinger talks about what should happen to an author's work after his death. He says that a hundred years should pass before an author's work is put before the public. So in that sense, we're 91 years ahead, given that it's only nine years since he passed away. The literary estate wanted not only to satisfy the curiosity of the public, but also address stories about Salinger that his family and trust believed to be misleading. They felt strongly that it was important for people to be able to see and hear Salinger in his own words. And I think you can do that through the letters that are in this exhibition. The collection includes photos from childhood, his time in World War II, and later in life. Handwritten manuscripts, correspondences with friends, and personal belongings fill the space. What I wanted to present visitors with was a strong sense of Salinger as a writer and as a reader. Many visitors are drawn to Salinger because of the quality of his fiction, but they also want to get inside of his head. Next to many scripts and cover markups of Catcher and the Rye are books from Salinger's personal collection. These were kept on his bookshelf, just an arm's length away from his bed. Also in display is one of his oldest possessions, a small bowl he made at the age of 10 and kept with him throughout his life. One of the things that I found touching it has nothing to do with writing. It gave me a sense of Salinger as a man. But his son told me that he would sometimes take a pipe and get a piece of burning coal or wood from the fireplace and drop it into the bowl and just sit and hold it because he liked the warmth of the, the, the feeling of the warmth of that wood in his hand. His journal entries and correspondences to friends like Ernest Hemingway and New York writers like William Sean and William Maxwell reveal his reflections on society and the world at the time. Through these notes and Salinger's belongings, the New York Public Library creates a portrait of a man, his relationships, values and a life lived, but rarely seen by the public. Salinger fan and writer Christopher Jensma joins me now from New York City. Hi, Christopher. Good to have you on our show today. So, decades on, especially uh, Catcher in the Rye is still everywhere. I mean, it's selling millions each year. It's a staple in high school curriculums. But then it's receiving a lot of criticism as well. I know you're a fan, so please convince me. Why should we care about J.D. Salinger and especially Catcher in the Rye? Uh, I think Catcher in the Rye is uh, known by many as a book now, as you mentioned, that, you know, they have to read in high school. It's often assigned. Uh, and uh, and that's when a lot of people discover it for the first time. That's when I discovered it as a sophomore in high school here. Uh, and um, I think it's uh, often kind of misunderstood uh, in that way as um, kind of a young adult novel. Uh, it is a coming of age story, of course, but about Holden Caulfield. But uh, it's, uh, it really has much deeper themes. Uh, 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 Rereading it as an adult, I mm -hmm. think you take more okay. from it. Why was it misunderstood? What do you mean by that? Well, I think because Holden himself as a teenage, you know, narrator and the story is so compelling and uh, his problems, you know, seem on the surface very unique to, uh, you know, a self-centered teenage boy who doesn't really understand how to deal with other people. He thinks they're phonies. Um, he, uh, he feels lonely all the time. He can't figure out how to get through school. 
Um, and uh, and so on the surface, it seems as if he's dealing with, you know, sort of adolescent problems. But uh, beneath the surface of that is uh, a much deeper story about a boy who's overcoming uh, deep trauma in his life. His younger brother is, has died when he was young. Um, and uh, he's trying to figure out how to make his way in the world. So are you telling me that Holden Caulfield is not a spoiled and whiny white kid? I think he is a spoiled and whiny white kid. I think he might just be more than that uh, when you dig below that. Um, and I do think that um, that when you yeah when you when you take his privileged background uh, into account, it becomes a part of his character that we can uh, analyze and understand. Okay, so a lot of people are saying that. Um the Catcher in the Rye is losing its grip on the kids, the teen teenagers these days, because when you look at today's pop culture heroes, they're not the beautiful losers anymore. I mean, consider Harry Potter, for example. They are conquering the world. Do you feel like it is irrelevant in that sense? Because alienation in the age of Facebook and social media is not a forefront theme anymore, is it? It's it's interesting. I, I I work with a lot of college students here, and what I what I see a lot when I teach the book with uh, with them is that they they still relate to the uh, themes of alienation very deeply. Um, there was a, a a wonderful psychology book that came out around the time of Catcher in the Rye called The Lonely Crowd, uh, which really captivates what happens with Holden. He's surrounded by friends and family. He finds himself in New York City. Um, and yet he's completely detached and alone. And I think that a lot of young people today do still feel that way with social media even. It's, it's very surface oriented and, uh, and there's still, uh, to use Holden's word, right, a lot of phoniness. Uh, and I think a lot of people do notice that Holden's dealing with some similar things. Okay, if Holden was growing up today, do you think he would feel uh, alone in the same way? Yeah, I can imagine sort of a modern day Holden would, you know, be uh, maybe similar to like the character in the recent movie Eighth Grade uh, that uh, was, um, uh, you know, sort of lost amidst uh, a world of other people who seem to be more successful or more interesting on Instagram and, and Snapchat and more aware of the fact that, um, you know, that he's being left out. Okay, so... Um what do you think about the language used in the book? Because um, another criticism, another very uh, common criticism is that it's a bit of an outdated language. It's uh, post-war colloquialism. Do you find it problematic in that sense, reading Catcher in the Rye, making a compulsory in high schools in 2019? Yeah, I do think that there are, for instance, better choices probably for more, you know, if, you, if what you'd like to teach the students is some, you know, character that sounds a little bit more like them today. I think there are probably other, uh, other kinds of choices. Um, with Catcher in the Rye, though, there is, I think once you kind of get used to it and you sort of get through his, uh, you know, he overuses the word phony, for instance, and uh, there are other, other things like that. Um, but once you kind of get into it and maybe even start to read it a little bit now as a historical novel, as something that uh, talks about what adolescence was like in the late 40s or the early 50s uh, when the book came out, uh, I do think that students would uh, still be able to get a lot out of it. Well, Christopher Jensma, it was good to have you on our show today. Thank you so much for joining us.